3, December 1st. 1763, a 27-year-old Patrick Henry argued what today is known as the Parsons Cause jury trial in Virginia. And not only did it pretty much launch his career and fame as a Patriot Act, it was a really important event in the early days of the American Revolution. But of course, it's almost totally forgotten or completely ignored today. And since, well, I was also born on December 1st, yesterday was my birthday, it's also one of my favorite events in the American Revolutionary history. So on this episode, I've got some historical background plus some foundational principles from Henry that really serve as a precursor to so much of the work that we do here at the TAC today. Sovereignty, delegated and reserve powers, resistance to usurpation, and even a little on the power of the jury. But first of all, before getting to that, a quick hello and a huge thank you. Thank you so much for being here, whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one, going on about four and a half years. One of these days I'm going to start numbering these, but definitely not yet. Uh, but since it's Fast Friday, I promise to not take up too much of your time. Let's see if I can get this info out to you in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And I should mention that if you want to follow along with the stuff that I mentioned in this episode, I'm just scratching the surface. So if you want to read and learn more, in context on your own time. I will definitely link to all the stuff that I'm mentioning in this episode. I publish a blog post about one to two hours after each live stream is done over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Let's get to it. First of all, a little background so you understand what's going on with this Parsons cause. Here from the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, they point out that the Parsons cause was a legal and it's actually a legal and political conflict, depending on where you see it in history. It definitely was legal and political conflict rooted in the volatility of the tobacco based economy and the state sponsored Church of England. The Anglican Church in Virginia was funded through public revenues. And like other public officials, clergymen were paid their annual salaries in tobacco. And one of the big reasons is if you study through the history of this, Hard currency was really pretty scarce at the time in Virginia. And here from historic St. John's Church, they note that according to legislation passed in 1748, Virginia's Anglican clergy were to be paid 16,000 pounds of tobacco per year. So they're getting paid in pounds of tobacco. But following a poor harvest, we understand supply and demand and some inflationary impacts of things today and following a poor harvest and well some of us do hopefully hopefully more do over time a poor harvest in 1758 the price of tobacco rose from two to six pennies per pound effectively inflating clerical salary so what did they do to deal with this all of a sudden it started getting really expensive to deal with this and in an article that we published just yesterday by mike meharry he said to mitigate the impact of the tobacco shortage the House of Burgesses passed the Two Penny Act. This was a law authorizing the payment of, quote, public, county, and parish levies and officers' fees in currency or tobacco notes backed by tobacco with a price set back at that standard two pence per pound. Now, acting royal governor Francis Fouquier, I'm not sure, Fouquier? signed the act into law despite the fact that doing so was likely in opposition to his royally mandated instructions. Now, the governor at that time, he was new. I think he just came in there sometime early in 1758. He was acting royal governor. He stayed there for a number of years, but he wrote that he signed it basically because he was new and it was almost unanimous in passing and doing so, vetoing it would have been a very, very bad political move on his part. He said it would be a bad choice, quote, to set my face against the whole colony by refusing the bill. So there was enough political pressure that the governor decided to do the right thing, even though it was probably in his royal duties to do the wrong thing. Mike writes on, he said, the king's veto. Now, this actually, um, what ended up happening was a bunch of the clergymen, about half or so, got together in a big protest, and they reported this to the Board of Trade. The Board of Trade made a recommendation to King George III, and King George III, on the recommendation of the Board of Trade, vetoed the local legislation. So you could have a Virginia colonial legislation, and if you don't like it, you protest it, and then the king can say, uh-uh, we don't like this, and the king vetoed it. And Mike points out that the king's vetoed outraged many Virginia leaders. They viewed King George's action as, 
as a usurpation of their local legislative authority. He didn't even think of these types of things. There's delegated and reserved power. Well, not necessarily delegated powers, but a line in the sand of what the far off central government can do, leaving the reserved powers to the colonies. Very similar in structure, kind of a precursor to the Tenth Amendment. Mike points out that this would become an ongoing theme in the following years as Parliament asserted more and more control or tried to over colonial affairs. He said the king's veto set the stage for Reverend James Morey to go to court in order to collect damages. So because it was vetoed, then he was able to sue to get basically his back pay. Maury believed he was entitled to the four penny difference between the two he was paid under the colonial law and the six penny market price of tobacco. And uh, now Maury actually won the first case, the first round in court, but the judge actually held that the amount of damages to be awarded had to be determined by a jury. And here's where a young Patrick Henry, almost relatively uh, unknown, very few people knew who he was at the time. He was just 27-ish. And Mike writes that Patrick Henry was a relatively unknown lawyer, but was assigned to defend Hanover County against Maury's claim. On December 1st, 1763, Henry rose and delivered probably what is the first widely known of his very fiery speeches. People talk about Henry's ability to move mountains, the thunderous roar of his speeches. And he delivered a fiery speech there in 1763 to the jury. And he argued that King George had no authority to veto a duly enacted Virginia law. Again, line in the sand. It's a kind of a precursor to the 10th Amendment, delegated and reserved powers. The king could do general stuff. Even the king could only do general stuff. And ever all the local concerns were to be dealt with in Virginia by the people and the representatives of Virginia. And that's what Patrick Henry made the case for back in 1763, that the king had no authority to even veto a duly enacted Virginia law. And that because of this, Virginians were under no obligation to obey the king's actions. Now, in a letter uh, a little bit later on, Maury described Henry's speech and Henry's position on this. And he said that uh, Patrick Henry took the position that the act of 1758, the Two Penny Act, had every characteristic of a good law that it was a law of general utility and could not consistently with what he called, this is what Patrick Henry called, the original compact between king and people stipulating protection on the one hand and obedience on the other be annulled. So this idea of a compact, an agreement between the people and their so-called rulers, and because of that, the king had no authority to actually annul the local law. And Mike points out that by invoking the term original compact, Henry was asserting the constitutional understanding of the rights of Virginia citizens. This is much much earlier than the idea of a compact among the states in the Articles of Confederation and beyond. So Henry was an early, early pioneer in this type of understanding. Mike goes on, he says, in his view, the king did not have any authority to overturn local represent representation and any attempt to do so was void. And throughout the ratification debates, talking about these revolutionary principles being brought forward into the Constitution for the United States, we saw leader at founder after founder after founder, whether it was Roger Sherman or James Iredell or so many others talking about acts that are outside the delegated powers of the Constitution, they would be void. And as Alexander Hamilton even put it in Federalist Number 33, acts not in pursuance of the delegated powers of the Constitution would be void and deserve to be treated as such as well. And that's the same type of position that Patrick Henry was taking, establishing these principles all the way back in 1763. The only one that I really know of, and I'll probably learn more over time, that was maybe a little bit earlier was James Otis Jr. in 1761, pointing out that an act against the Constitution is void. Same viewpoint up in Massachusetts. Going further, this is back from Maury's letter describing Patrick Henry's take. Hence, he inferred, quote, that a king 
by annulling or disallowing laws of this salutary nature from being the father of his people, degenerates into a tyrant and forfeits all right to his subjects' obedience. You are not bound to obey them is the view that Patrick Henry took consistently over the years when government went beyond its just limits. And here back to St. John's Church, the historian writing for this, pointed out that the jury was so moved by Henry's powerful speech that they awarded Maury one penny in damages. So he had this lawsuit trying to get four pennies per pound, and the damages they awarded him was just one penny. The award, the historian notes, essentially nullified the crown veto and no other clergy sued. Now, this is definitely not jury nullification, but it shows here in 1763 the power of a jury to creatively stay on the side of the king, but make the award to the person so low that it was pointless to go through a court case, nullifying that veto in practice and effect. Now, less than two years later, Patrick Henry used the same principles and approach in his resolutions that he drafted against the hated Stamp Act of 1765. And I think the great quote from that one is that the people are, again, not bound to yield obedience. Those are Patrick Henry's terms in 1765 as well. I will link to an episode I did on that, Patrick Henry versus the Stamp Act, back from 2020 that I think is a really good history lesson, a really good strategy approach, philosophical foundation for resistance and nullification for us today. I will link to that in the show notes. Again, uh, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And I think the big points that we get out of this, out of this one brief history lesson on Patrick Henry's positions on sovereignty and obedience and limits of power and the power of the jury and things like that. One, we get a local assembly using a very creative legislative tool to deal with something. Then we get a governor under political pressure from the local assembly and the general public to take the action that the people want locally, even though the governor knows full well that the central government probably isn't going to like it. Then we have Patrick Henry, of course, arguing that the king need not be obeyed. They're not bound to yield obedience. And then on top of a jury, again, while not directly jury nullification, certainly put an end nullified in practice and effect, even a royal veto. There's a lot that we can take home today and use this type of thing in strategy, in practice today. Much of it actually translates very similarly to the advice that James Madison gave us in Federalist 46 on how to beat federal programs without relying on the federal government to magically limit its own power. Maybe we'll do a comparison to that at some point in the future. I discussed that with Meher and he's like, oh yeah, wow, it's really fascinating how similar these strategies are. Anyways, I hope you found this interesting. I hope it was educational, more important than anything. I hope you learned something. If you support the work that we're doing, you wanna help us get this message out to more and more people, these historical lessons, and application for advancing liberty today in the face of the largest government in history. Nothing helps us do this work more than the financial faith and support of our members. You can join us for as little as two bucks a month over at tenthamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, I really appreciate you being here. I hope you have a great weekend and I will see you next week here on the Path to Liberty.